Hey, how's it going? I'm slightly burnt out on Generation 1 because I did a ditto run last week that took me two weeks and about 23 hours to trudge through. And this week, I thought I'd take a step back and we'll do something fun. Oftentimes in my runs, I'll talk about this or that move being really good or even broken in Generation 1. And I thought I would take the time to kind of articulate my thoughts on it and go into some detail about exactly why they're so strong and things of that nature. If you are a fan of my small channel or maybe you watch other big solo run channels. You might know some of this information already, but I thought it sounded like a good idea to compile it all in one video and make it a top 10 list. But before we jump in, I do Pokemon solo runs fairly often, and if that's of interest to you, consider subscribing to be kept up to date on my videos. And if you're someone who just normally never comments or interacts, just take a second and scroll down and type in your guess about what you think will be number one on the list, or maybe just what you think will be on the list in general. I think it'll be fun to know what you guys think and how it might differ from from me, and with that said, let's just dive into it. Before I get into the list proper, I'd like to give an honorable mention to Thunderbolt here. It's a 95 base power move and eventually it got nerfed to 90 base power in Generation 6 and it has 100% accuracy. I often say in my videos that this is the premier coverage move for red, blue, and yellow. And the reason is that it's just so pivotal in the final 6 fights of the game. Let's just take Lorelei for instance. It can be a real hassle for a ton of Pokemon, specifically for Pokemon with a physical moveset. She uses Growl a lot. All of her Pokemon outside of Jinx are weak to Thunderbolt and it just makes it worth it in its own right just for that. It's also great in the multiple fights against the rival and the eventual champion fight. Pokemon like Pidgeot and maybe Gyarados or even Blastoise depending on what slot you chose your starter in can make that fight much easier as well. The real reason that this move is even mentioned right now is how it trivializes Lance's Gyarados because it has a times 4 weakness to it and I hold firm with the opinion that this Gyarados is the biggest menace to society and if you cannot deal with it fast you're just gonna have a bad Bad run. At the number 10 spot, I put Body Slam. It doesn't really look like much on the surface. It's an 85 base power, 100% accuracy normal move, and that just means it'll pretty much be doing neutral damage to just about everything outside of Ghost. It has a nice 30% chance to paralyze the target unless it's also a normal type. What really makes this move so strong is how early you get it. You can essentially just make a beeline straight to it without even beating the second gym if you want to go that route. A ton of Pokemon can learn this move, and having a move with a base power that high that early in the game can more or less just trivialize a lot of the main fights coming up. It's so low on the list because this is one of the few moves that actually received a couple of buffs in later generations. Generation 2 and onwards, the normal types are not immune to the paralysis part of the move anymore. And Generation 6 made this amazing change to where if an enemy Pokemon uses Minimize, Body Slam will now do double damage and bypass accuracy checks to always hit. And that's actually genius. I love that change. But when you're doing a run like Eevee or just a normal type Pokemon in general, where it gets the same type attack bonus, you end up pretty much having your best move for the entire run very quickly, and it's no secret why Game Freak stopped giving you things this powerful this early in the game. At the number 9 spot, I have Reflect. Out of all the moves on the list, this one is exactly one that is used on your own Pokemon or that you would use, but it's rather something used in key fights that can go against you. It essentially halves physical damage against you. Technically, it doubles the defense of the active Pokemon, and what makes this such a headache is that it doesn't wear off. It lasts forever in Generation 1. A good example of where this really shines and is really annoying is against rival number 5's Alakazam. His execute before that will set up Reflect. This means when Whenever it comes in and you have to deal with it, it'll essentially just be taking half damage from an attack that otherwise would just take it out in one shot, and that can easily lead to a reset and a run and just cause a bunch of trouble. I have actually used it in a few runs because it's essentially like having a super version of the Intimidate ability, and it makes fights where a lot of physical damage is going to be coming in fairly trivial. It makes you extremely tanky. Like a lot of moves in this list, this move was changed immediately in Generation 2 to only last 5 turns before it has to be reapplied rather than just like last forever. Good change. Let's move on.
It's no secret that Psychic was the dominant type in Generation 1. There's not many things that's going to resist it, and nothing's really going to do super effective against it because bugs are awful. At the number 8 spot, I put Psychic here because it's a very simple but very powerful move. Outside of other Psychic types, anything and everything is just going to get blasted by this 90 base power move. And on top of that, you have about a 1 out of 3 chance to lower the opponent's special. And since special was a unified stat in Gen 1, encompassing both attack and defense, it makes it just that much more strong. When special was changed to attack and defense in generation 2 onwards, the proc was then changed to drop only special defense and the chance for it to happen was also lowered to 10%. Keep in mind that in gen 2, ghost types also got shadow ball, bug types were improved, steel types are now a thing, they resist it, and then dark types can just dominate it and it just put an overall end to psychic types dominance. But in generation 1, the best move on the best type is worthy of a slot on this list and that's why it's here. Crabhammer at the number 7 spot might be surprising, but let's just dive into it. There aren't many exclusive moves in Generation 1, and the main reason that this one is overlooked is that it's only found on Krabby and Kingler, whose special stat is honestly just pathetic. It has a great 90 base power, but it has a subpar 85% accuracy, but what makes this move one of the most powerful moves in the game is that it gets the increased crit ratio, and with how crit works in Generation 1 being directly tied to your speed, it means that things can really get out of hand. When you take it into account the same type attack bonus and the critical hit bonus damage, these moves can get well over 200 base power, all the way up to about 225, even higher than that. And even with really bad special, a Pokemon like Krabby can just do really well in the game based off of this one move. This move has even gotten some love from Game Freak in later gens as well. They increased the accuracy to be 90% in Gen 5, and in Gen 6 they increased the base power to up to 100. And this spot on the list kind of also serves as a slight honor mention to all of the other high crit ratio moves like Slash because they are all really great but I always wonder what Crab Hammer can do if you would get it on a competent Pokemon that had good special. I think a Pokemon with good special and Crab Hammer could dominate the game and have the best time but we'll never know. For the number 6 slot, I put Mimic. I'm not a historian of the game, but it feels like for well over a decade, maybe even getting close to two decades, this move was just kind of overlooked and some people probably thought it was useless. When the solo run boom started to take over years ago, this move not only found its niche, but it also became a key component to some Pokemon making it through the game. This move is obviously limited to what your opponent knows, but if you have the full knowledge of the game, you know every moveset your opponent has, it becomes a very versatile attack and it can fill in any gaps and holes that the Pokemon that you're using might have. Whether it be taking agility from Pidgeot on rival number 6 or taking Amnesia from Lorelei's Slowbro or taking Alakazam's Recover in the champion fight, Mimic has just shown run after run why it's a very powerful move to fuse correctly. It was nerfed into the ground and essentially became a slightly better mirror move in generation 2, meaning that you could only copy the last move used and after using it to its full potential in these games, I can see why they would do that. Now we're getting into these final slots and we're starting to get into the things that probably come to people's mind if they are in the know. At number 5 we have Wrap. On the surface level, this move doesn't really look great. It doesn't have 100% accuracy, not even close to it. It has a lowly 15 base power and it lasts from 2 to 5 turns. So what makes a move like this broken? Well there are two things. The first is that while you use Wrap, the opposing Pokemon can't take its turn. It's essentially like a status condition like sleep or full paralysis and it just straight up stops your opponent from really playing the game. They can't do anything. The second thing is that if you outspeed your opponent, it's possible just to wrap lock your opponent from 100 HP all the way down to zero. It's a very oppressive strategy and outside of missing since it doesn't have the best accuracy, there's literally nothing you can do to stop it. Obviously this move was severely nerfed in later generations and that's well deserved. It's worth noting that there are other trap moves in the game like fire spin and they can be just as oppressive but rap is the best of the bunch. Blizzard comes in at the number 4 spot, 
And it's a move I admittedly don't use as much as I should in my runs, but I just can't deny the power. It's a massive 120 base power in Gen 1, and the fact that fire doesn't resist ice moves in this game, it's in a spot where this nuke doesn't have many things that it can't hit for at least neutral damage. Toss in a 10% chance to freeze the opponent, which is essentially a death sentence in Generation 1, and you start to see why it's on this spot. What makes Blizzard so busted in Generation 1 is that it has an absurdly high 90% accuracy for a move of this power. Game Freak immediately knew that they made a mistake, and they nerfed it instantly to 70% accuracy in Gen 2 onwards. The only thing that really balances Blizzard is the fact that it only has 5 power points and you have to make it all the way to Cinnabar to get access to it, but it's really powerful and the changes made in later generations show that Game Freak's in agreement with that. The number 3 spot contains a move in the same vein as Blizzard, an extremely powerful move where the drawback isn't that huge. Can I interest you guys in a 150 base power move that does neutral damage on pretty much all but one top and has 90% accuracy? Well friends, welcome to Hyper Beam. The drawback, and I'm using air quotes that you can't see right now, uh, is that when you use Hyper Beam, you are supposed to take the next turn to recharge, which essentially halves the damage on top of you essentially skipping your turn, but where the broken this comes of this move is that in Gen 1 Hyper Beam, you don't have to recharge if you knock out your opponent. It means you get all of the benefit of this massive 150 base power nuke without any of the drawbacks, and I don't really need to say anything more than that. Just like with Blizzard, it does only have 5 power points, and the Pokemon that can learn it naturally are very limited. Gyarados, Aerodactyl, Snorlax, and the Dratini Evolution line are the only Pokemon that learn it, and they all learn it past level 50. And if you actually want to get the TM, you have have to waste time at the game corner, which really isn't an option for me personally because I'm always racing the clock in the runs that I do. In the runner-up spot, I'm putting Amnesia. I've talked earlier about how Gen 1 Special encompasses both attack and defense, and Amnesia is a move that raises your special by two stages. Just on its own merits, it's an extremely powerful effect that can make Pokemon like Snorlax or Slowbro become absurdly tanky and be able to become an offensive powerhouse at the same time. But you guys know that that's not the only effect that this move has. Generation 1, we all know it's a very flawed game, and chief among the bugs and glitches is the badge boost glitch. For the uninitiated, beating every odd number gem will give you a 12.5% boost in one of your stats outside of HP. Brock gives attack, Lieutenant Surge gives defense, Coco gives speed, and Blaine gives special attack. And when your stats are altered in Gen 1, there's a glitch that reapplies these 12.5% buffs. That means if you take something simple like, a, like your opponent uses a tail whip on you and you have 7 badges, it's not just lowering your defense like it's intended, it's it's also reapplying the badge boost and it's raising your attack, your defense, your speed, and your special by another 12.5%. This is arguably the most broken thing about Generation 1, and in pre-evolve runs, with some exceptions, having a way to trigger the badge boost for yourself is the difference in having an elite run or just being an all-out terrible Pokemon if you don't have it. Just look at the difference between my Cubone and my Sandshrew runs. They have similar movesets, they have the same type, and Cubone starts with Bone Club and that means it can cruise past Brock roughly an hour faster than Sandshrew. But Sandshrew just gets access to Swords Dance, a move that raises your attack two stages, and when you account in for the badge boost it's also giving, you have the difference in Sandshrew actually being able to do a five hour respectable run, or Cubone actually having one of the worst runs I've ever done in my life. That's the huge difference a badge boosting move can make. It's extremely powerful, it's extremely broken, and it's about as generation one as it gets, and I love it. This slot could easily go to any move that kind of acts as a way to badge boost yourself, whether it be Defense Curl, Harden, Swords Dance, Growth, Meditate, or really just whatever, but for my money, Amnesia is an elite move on its own right, and it triggering the badge boost easily elevates it above the rest to sit at its rightful spot at number 2. So you might be thinking, Matt, badge boosting is easily the most broken thing in Gen 1. What could possibly be at the top spot if it's not that? Well friends, for me personally, I think sleep is the most broken thing in Gen 1. It lasts a massive 1-7 to seven turns, and further generations keep nerfing this to the point to where now it only lasts 3 turns maximum. And on top of that, in Gen 1, a sleeping Pokemon can't act 
on the turn it wakes up, which was changed later. This means if you get perfect RNG, you can essentially take a Pokemon out of commission for eight turns. And most fights within a battle don't even last anywhere close to that long. Sleep Powder is generally the better sleep move of Gen 1. It has a 75% chance to put the opponent to sleep, and Hypnosis follows down that list with a mere 55% coin flip to do the same thing, but the effect is so powerful and the moves are good. Now the absolute most broken move in the entire game is another exclusive move that I showed off several weeks ago. I did a Paris and a Parasec run, and that move is Spore. Spore is beyond busted when you see that it has an absurd 100% accuracy to trigger the most broken effect in the game. It's essentially the bonuses of wrap that can last up to 8 turns, but instead of just being trapped into wrap yourself, you get to do whatever move you want. With growth or swords dance to ensure that you outspeed your opposition, Paris and Parasect can pretty much win any battle if you play it right. Spore turns what normally would be pretty pathetic Pokemon with several double weaknesses into something that's pretty respectable and if any other Pokemon that was good on its own got this move, it would it would just dominate the game. And that's my list. Do you agree or disagree? Let me know below. But after finishing the list, I would just honestly like to see how a Pokemon with some good stats would perform if it had Amnesia, Spore, Crab Hammer, and Psychic. That would probably get my vote for the most absurd moveset. I shudder to think of what maybe Mewtwo could do with a set like that, but in reality, Mewtwo is my current record holder, and it doesn't need badge boost or status conditions to dominate the game. So maybe just Mewtwo with Crab Hammer would be a funny thing to see, but I don't know. I'm just rambling at this point. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed a different type of video this week, kind of articulating how I feel about some of the Gen 1 moves and how the mechanics combined with the bugs and glitches make them the strongest. And I feel like after playing tons of Gen 1 games to completion, I'm qualified to finally give my opinion on it. And if you're still around at the end of the video, I appreciate you. And next week, I'll get back into another How Fast Style run with Mew, which you may have noticed in a clip or two. If you have seen all my other videos, you know it's coming now. But have a wonderful week. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye.